Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street is a progressive campaign agency that specialises in campaigning and community organising. We work with non-profit and community-based organisations, trade unions, progressive businesses and social democratic parties across the globe. Dunn Street develops community engagement and organising strategies to win campaigns both big and small and we train engagement staff, volunteers and community organisers in leadership and power building. And if you want to create change in your community in 2023, then hit us up at dunnstreet.com.au. Today's episode is also brought to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. When you need legal support with an issue, it can feel daunting. And that's why for over 100 years, Morris Blackburn has been helping guide clients with their legal needs. They're here to help you when you need them the most, from workplace to medical injuries, class actions, occupational diseases and wills and estate planning. And as Australia's leading plaintiff law firm, they have the local knowledge and the national network with experience that you can count on. To find out more, simply go to morrisblackburn.com.au. And finally, today's episode is brought to you by SwiftFox. Every moment on a campaign matters. You need the tools that you can trust, lists that are up to date, phone banks that can change minds, emails that drive donations, and events that will energise the community both online and offline, plus text blasts that distill your message perfectly well. That is a lot of things that Swift Fox CRM can do because it's made for campaigners by campaigners. And to find out more, simply go to their website, which is swiftfoxcrm.com, to win your next campaign. Hello and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic, your weekly centre-left politics and organising podcast that drops every Friday that dives into the progressive campaigns of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad. And today's episode, we're going to be talking to the National Secretary of the Community and Public Sector Union, Mel Donnelly. Uh, Mel is on the show to talk about uh, her entry into uh, the trade union movement, uh, some of the challenges that the CPSU and its members have gone through under the previous Conservative government, uh, their hopes, dreams and aspirations of what they want to achieve uh, under this new Labor government uh, and some of the lessons that they've taken from a lot of their campaigns that they've been working on and what that means for members uh, into the future. Looking forward to having a good chat with uh, Mel Donnelly on today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcast, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like the show, don't be shy. Just give us, a, give us some five stars on Apple Podcast or on Spotify when you're done listening or leave us a review on Apple Podcast. That would be great. Uh, and for all the updates, follow Dunn Street on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. All right, let's get to today's episode. We're taping this one on a Thursday afternoon on the lands of the Wurundjeri people. Uh, and joining me on the line is someone who we tried to interview for our uh, union podcast that we did the Fringe uh, uh, program at the ALP National Conference the other week up in Brisbane. Uh, but unfortunately, she got stuck on the floor of a conference and couldn't make it, uh, which was a shame. But we've got her here now. So the spotlight's really on her now because you can't hide between the questions I was throwing at uh, uh, her two union colleagues. But it's great to have her on the podcast. She is the National Secretary of the Community and Public Sector Union. I don't think I need to describe who they cover. That's pretty self-explanatory in the name of the title. Melissa Donnelly, welcome to Socially Democratic. Thank you for having me. Uh, now, let's uh, before we talk about sort of contemporary union stuff, let's um, let's get down to some important things here. You are a member of the Donnelly clan, and I need to know how we are related. I made a joke in the actual episode that you and I were cousins, but obviously we're not. Um, where are your people from, and how do they come to these shores? Yeah, absolutely. So I am of uh, solid Irish descent and my family um, has been um, in Australia for, for many, many generations. So came out a long time ago. I think all of my great grandparents were even born here. So a long history um, in this country, but definitely um, from uh, the Irish shores. Do you like know what part of Ireland they're from originally? Uh, look, I think for a range of areas, but Northern Ireland, some of the northern areas in particular, um, but uh, on each side of my family is um, very strong Irish stock. So um, uh, good representation across across the country in Ireland as well. Excellent. So you're, you can say you're 100% Celtic. Um, I think my family, uh, I know that my grandfather, uh, Francis Donnelly, is from uh, Castle Blaney in, in County Monaghan, which is in... Um, 
in in the province of Ulster, but in the in the south, it's in the Republic. It got cut out when they were drawing the borders because it was too many uh, uh, you know nationalist voters in that area. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, you're saying your family probably from uh, the north. I think originally the Donnellys are all Tyrone people, from what I from my history. I don't know, maybe that's probably where your folks are from too. Yeah, perhaps perhaps far enough back in time. I'm sure they were hanging out in a pub together. Um, I must admit, I've never. And the other thing I was thinking about is there are a number of Donnellys that have ascended to the senior leadership roles within a, the trade union movement here in this country. I can think of three other national secretaries that share our wonderful surname. Um, I've never met anyone who's a Donnelly that isn't from the left, but if I did, I'd be horrified. And I want to get a sense from you about where were your, you, you just don't naturally become left wing because you're a Donnelly, but where were your values shaped as a young person? Look, I think I've always had, um, you know, really progressive values and, um, you know, from a young age was interested in politics and the progressive movement. Um, and I always saw unions and the labour movement as a way that you can affect social change, progressive change on scale. Um, so I've always been attractive, attracted to progressive politics and I really saw the union movement as pivotal to actually how you affect that change in a wholesale way wholesale way across society. Where, where did you see that? Because, I mean, when I think about when I was a young kid growing up, like my parents voted Labor. We are a Labor household, but th- they weren't activists in any way, shape or form. And if you'd said to, uh, you know, a 15-year-old Stephen Donnelly, one day you'll end up working for the trade union movement, I wouldn't have ne- even known that there was a, you know, there was a vocational career in that, in that world. When did you start to make this connection that unions can play a role? Yeah, I guess my story is pretty similar. I grew up in a, um, a Labor household and um, parents, strong um, supporters of the Labor movement, but, but not activists in um, the conventional sense. Um, I grew up in the seat of Benelong uh, at a time that John Howard was uh, the sitting member, which also shaped my, um, you know, uh, experience and view of that. And I can remember, you know, being um, the school captain at high school and John Howard would come along as a local member and you were just sort of shocked by some of his views. And I really remember as um, a young teenager, the Pauline Hanson experience and when she was elected to parliament, it was one of the times I just started to realise, well, not everyone agrees with you um, on some of these matters. And it actually matters to have a voice and have a say and, um, you know, stand up for what you think's right. So I guess, you know, those kind of things shaped my uh, worldview and my politics. In terms of coming to the union movement, um, my background is um, as a lawyer and I, you know, at some point thought I'd probably go to the bar or something like that. But I did work from uh, become a member of the CPSU from a young age and work with the CPSU on some pretty significant litigation. And I realised that it was actually through the union, not just through court cases, but through the union that you can make bigger change. And um, from that time, I've, I've never left the movement. It's funny how you do work these things out as you go, right? It's kind of like I know that you. I come across people who have got a clear five, ten year plan, and I admire those people. Like I don't. I've never been able to do that. I barely can work out what I'm doing next week, let alone what I'm doing in five years' time. Um, so I feel like my life just kind of stumbled into the things that I've done. Um, go, before you talk about the, the stuff you're doing in a legal world, I actually want to pick, up, pick your brain on that relationship, well, not that moment where you've, you're meeting the Prime Minister. Was John Howard the Prime Minister when you were the school captain? Um, yes, he would have. He would have been, yeah. So he was um, a long-time lo- local member um, and would attend our school from time to time. And um, and, and you so, met, and you actually met him in your capacity as the school captain? Yeah, I probably would have at different times. And, like, it was, I don't know, I think that, and it was all at the time when uh, the Pauline Hanson stuff was quite rife and, you know, lots of school kids got um, involved in those kind of campaigns. So it, it really brought into sharp focus that, you know, politics matters mm. to people's um, daily lives and, and the value in which we hold different people in society. It's weird to think, like, I, I, I don't think Paul and Hanson, it's remarkable how that politician has managed to reinvent themselves on multiple occasions. Because, um, yes, you're right, way, way back in the sort of the, when she emerged on the, the national political scene, I kind of thought that, well, you know, this is terrible. I d- clearly, we don't align with her values and the things that she's saying. But I didn't think that that would last, I think. I know I'm going off a tangent a bit here, but what what do you think has happened that has enabled someone like her to continue to 
you know, be on the on a, on the national. Uh, I, I even don't even want to elevate it to say the national debate because I don't think she adds to the debate. But certainly, there is a, she has a national presence, right? What has what has enabled f- for her to continue to be here when I think that most politics in this country is quite centrist, right? It's either centre left or centre right, but she's out in sort of Genghis Khan country. Yeah, look, I, I, I don't know. I think that's a tough question. I think um, whilst I, of course, 100% disagree with her views on things, um, I think the way she's given a platform in the media and the way she um, speaks uh, to the broader population allows her sort of a cut through um, as compared with how some people might feel about, you know, what they call professional politicians or something like that. So I think there's a range of ways in which she's been um, elevated beyond her um, actual appeal and support um, and has used that, you know, tactically pretty, um, you know, disadvantageously to the actual national debate. And you think about things like when she turned up in the Senate in a uh, full burqa, like it's it's just attention-grabbing stuff, um, but at times the media plays into that. Yeah. So did you, you've met John Howard, you're a school captain, clearly you you had an interest in leadership. Uh, why did you? Uh, what? Where was it? Where did the interest in um, the law come from? Um, look, I, I guess um, you know when I finished school, I um, undertook a double degree in law and social science. I was really interested in social science and um, you know how you support people, but I also thought that that um, uh, legal training and and that kind of study is also really important in understanding how. Uh, government and power and, um, you know, decisions are made in our society and how you actually influence them as well. Uh, and so but bit, there's lots of ways in which we can create change. And But why the law, though? Like, what, let's get to the, the you know, the nitty-gritty here. Why did you actually choose the law? Because, I mean, there's lot, as I said, there's different ways we can cr- cr- affect change, right? You can become a pol- public, pol- public policy person. You can... Uh, yeah, look, I think that, I mean, when I went into it as, you know, an 18 or 19-year-old, as you do, I don't know that I thought, um, you know, I'd be um, emulating LA law or anything like that. I, I, I think I really thought that um, it was an effective skill set to have um, to make an influence and an impact in terms of what I would want to do in my career. I didn't really have a firm view, I guess, when I started out at university about where I thought I wanted to go, but I knew I wanted to do something that um, had a bigger impact and that actually, you know, supported um, change in our society and that was really important to me. And I guess like many uni students, you step your way through it and and you see what happens at the end of the process. So when did you come across the CPSU? How did they come into your life? Uh, So I actually, um, uh, as a uni student, I um, undertook an internship program um, through the ANU and um, you were offered placements, often with politicians. Um, and I said I was interest, interested in industrial relations because I just saw that as such a fundamental part of law that affects every person's daily life and affects your ability um, to have a livelihood and um, and to support your family and to be safe at work and all these other things. And I remember they called me and they offered me um, an internship either at the CPSU or the Farmers Federation, and they did say to me, the ANU said to me, well, if you had a um, you know a political preference one way or the other, you it's best that you <laughs> choose that, reflect that in your choice. And I chose the union. <laughs> Fair enough. I wonder what that's a sliding doors moment. I wonder what would have happened if you'd chosen the Farmers Federation. I don't think I would. I don't think I would have done that well in my internship. I suspect. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and so your your role at the union. How did you? end up sort of working there professionally? Yeah, so from that time, from a quite uh, young age while I was still studying, I uh, worked on a range of um, full federal court matters and some that even were appealed to the High Court about rights of workers um, in a bargaining dispute against um, subsidiaries of Telstra at that time, which was really anti-union. Um, and uh, soon after finishing, um, the union asked me to come back and work on other matters. So in my early career, I actually spent a lot of time uh, in the Your Act at Work campaign for a number of years. Uh, we were in, engaged in litigation against the federal government because they would ban CPSU members as public servants from engaging in any activity in their own time about rights at, your rights at work campaign. 
Uh, and so for a number of years, we were engaged in this litigation against the federal government. And I was quite a young lawyer at that time. I think I was probably 25 when we started this. And it was me and one barrister and the Commonwealth would turn up with three silks and a, a full courtroom of um, lawyers and other barristers. And, you know, we won. And it really taught me, you know, that these things matter. Like our members wanted to, in their lunch break, in their own time, say that they thought work choices wasn't a fair thing and the government tried to silence them. It's such a classic kind of David and Goliath moment. Yeah, it was quite an eye-opening moment. And I guess it was early on in my career where I still thought maybe what I want to really be is a lawyer or maybe not. And I remember um, a couple of uh, senior people pulling me aside at that point when I was probably 26 or 27 when this finished and said, you'll never get a case like that again. That's, that's, that's your lawyer moment. Um, you should think about what you do next. And so what did you do next? I, I then decided to stay uh, with the union and so then I um, have done a range of roles within the union. I became um, the national lead um, for our full bargaining and industrial and policy strategy um, and then uh, at a later point I joined the executive uh, and looked after certain membership areas before I became national secretary. Prior to becoming national secretary, what was the toughest day on the job? Oh, that's a hard question. Um I think it's, that's a hard question because there's there are there are there are so many and there are times, you know, where even recently dealing with pretty awful workplace health and safety matters. But I do really burnt in my mind is coming to work the Monday after the um, the la, not the Albanese win federal election, but the one before when there was a lot of uh, our members and delegates who did think there was going to be a change of government. We had been through a long and protracted and ongoing industrial campaign uh, against the previous government. And I remember that was a really hard day to pick people up and say, you know, regardless of who the government is, we know what our values are, we know what we stand for and we'll keep going. Uh, but that was a hard moment. Is that uh, the 2019 federal? That's right. That's right. Yeah, that was a tough one. Um, so why did you want to take on a leadership role as the National Secretary? Um, I guess um, in respect to this role or any others I've done in the past, I think that um, the capacity to make a, a big difference um, and obviously, you know, with the support um, in, a, in a union role of your members and delegates, um, is what's so attractive about it. Like uh, when I think about what I working in this role with my members and delegates, what we can achieve together, um, sometimes it's daunting because there's so much to do, but like it's actually incredibly um, an incredibly privileged position to be in to, to be in the role that I have and actually affect broader change. So let's look back uh, in terms of where the unions come, and I want to get your thoughts and reflections on the on the years of operating under a coalition government. Um, what did that look like for your members? Like, what was the, what was the industrial impact that the previous coalition government had in the workplace? Oh, look, it, it was massive. We um, over the decade of the coalition government our members faced a really um, difficult industrial environment. The government had a very anti-union, anti-worker agenda. And one of the ways that really manifested through was through um, its bargaining policy. So it had a, an approach to bargaining um, which uh, involved absolute wage caps, uh, wage freezes at various points. Our members went through a you know four-year campaign without wage increases where the government's position for um, some period of that was you their offer to employees was a 0% pay increase and you lost most of your conditions. Um, so it was an incredibly hard period. People had to really dig in and fight. Um, we also, you know, things like paid domestic and family violence leave were also banned in the federal public service. They would not be provided. So it wasn't just about wages. It was about um, all the conditions that, that went alongside that. But also, you know, in the public service at that time, um, the previous government had very little respect for the work of the public service. They outsourced everything they could, um, you know, uh, they turned up and told, uh, various ministers would tell secretaries that uh, where the government, you stay in your lane, uh, you're not here to advise us. So it was a really difficult time um, 
in a whole range of ways. There wasn't respect. There wasn't, um, you know, an industrial relations approach that actually recognised and valued people's contributions. And um, that was felt on the front line as well as um, by top Mandarins. Was this uh, tone from or this approach from the federal government, the coalition government set from like day one? Like when was the moment you realised, oh, shit, here we are, we're in for it? Because, I mean, four years was a long time to be bargaining, right? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think that in in terms of um, uh, fr- from the change of government when Tony Abbott took office and then uh, unleashed that appalling budget um, with huge cuts, it was pretty clear what way they were going to go with the public service to the extent there was any doubt before that. Mm-hmm. Um, our, you know, there were eighteen thousand jobs cuts, job cuts. There were huge outsourcing. They, um, you know, undertook a commission of audit where they went through every agency and worked out what they could um, sell off or outsource. Now, because of campaigning by our members and the community, you know, there's a whole range of those proposals that didn't actually come to fruition, but it really set the agenda. And then we entered bargaining in um, 2014 and Erica Betts was the minister and it was an uh, absolute ideological uh warfare really. Mm. Uh, John Lloyd, the former building construction commissioner, was put in um, to the public service commission role and it created a level of disputation between employees and uh, public sector agencies that really was unprecedented. So going into those negotiations, you had a strategy. Um, What was that strategy and did you have to make adjustments over time? Because when it's a long campaign, you can't just keep, you know, I want to get your sense of how you sort of dealt with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in any campaign, I think you have to make adjustments as you go. Um, you know, we uh, we knew it was going to be hard. Uh, we, in setting that campaign up, you know, we talked to our members and uh, called it the safeguard campaign because we knew what we were in for. Um, perhaps not the extent of it, but we knew they were going to come after um, a whole range of rights, seek to reduce conditions and really hold back pay. So a, a lot of it was... Um, at, you know, building up that support in our membership to hold the line. Um, and then, uh, you know, and we, we we absolutely did that. We, you know, had um, enterprise agreements ballots where in major agencies where 90% of staff voted against the government's offer. Uh, but we also had to then build in industrial action um, across different agencies in, in a way that, um, you know, the public service hasn't seen industrial action on that scale for, for many decades. Um, so for our members... For some of our members, that was a a new and different experience to what they had in bargaining before and people had to, you know, dig in and stand up um, to hold on to their rights and conditions through that process. It's not, I mean, it's it's not an easy task to get your membership and you're a very big union. So it's, you know, it's a lot of people that you need to get to hold the line. How did you manage to do that? Like what were some of the tactics that you used to ensure that you're bringing your membership with you? Um, Look, I think there are a a whole range of ways uh, we undertook that, Um, you know, particularly at the early stages of the campaign, um, the government's position and the government's offer was so appalling and insulting that, um, you know, it it sort of uh, in part organised itself to Mm. start with. But it was it was a balance between um, doing all of that and also trying to um, map out a a pathway through it for people. Um, so definitely there was huge angst and uh, huge anger, um, not just from, you know, from union members definitely, but from the broader workforce as well. Um, but as we had to, as we went through that process and we had quite a uh, wide scale industrial action uh, with lots of members participating, we also had to step through h- how we can, you know, bring this, um, br- bring this to a fair ending, which was incredibly difficult given how, um, how difficult the approach the government was taking. Remind me, did you guys in the end, were you able to negotiate an agreement with the previous government? I can't remember what happened there. Yeah, so, so we did um, in from 2017, um, we did the major, the bigger agencies like Services Australia or Centrelink and the Tax Office and Defence and so on uh, did settle um, enterprise agreements. It was a, um, you know, an incredibly difficult settlement um, and one that people you know, would absolutely still raise today because the government had a position, um, even though, you know, there was no genuine negotiations, Mm. they had a position that there could be no back pay. So to hold on to your rights and to hold on to your conditions, um, you, 
you were penalised uh, by no back pay and people went without a pay rise for a number of years to hold on to that fight. In other areas like home affairs, it actually ended um, in um, p- protecting industrial action being terminated by the Fair Work Commission and an arbitration process. Right. Um, out of this darkness, what were some of the key lessons that the union uh, took from it? Um, I think that one of the key lessons undoubtedly, and I think this is true of um, pretty much every campaign I've ever seen, is that you, in, for a union, your delegates are everything. Um, they are the people who, um, you know, turn out um, uh, for an activity. They're the people who carry the room in their workplaces. They're the people who, um, uh, you know, turn around a campaign and, and can win you a campaign. And we had an exceptional uh, group of delegates right across the APS who who went through that process um, over a number of years in a really difficult way. I think the other thing that rings true, uh, reflecting on that that campaign and those years of campaigning, is people know um, people know their value. People know when they're being um, disrespected, and uh, when um, uh, the federal government in that instance, but an employer is just absolutely trying to. Um, take advantage and people are prepared to stand up for themselves um, in that circumstance and that's what our members did and had to do for a really concerted period of time. It's interesting that uh, the, your reflections on the delegate structure um, and did taking a lead from that does that mean that the union wants to continue to you know identify more leadership across your workplaces like expand the, the delegate network and also develop their skill sets? Like what do you then take from that to then think about how do you apply it today? Oh, absolutely. I think that um, for our union and I think for most unions, like the strength and capacity and engagement um, and health of your uh, delegate structures um, is absolutely, absolutely critical. Um, In my role now, whenever I have the opportunity you know, I absolutely make sure I attend all the delegate training and drop in and say hello and and um, talk to our delegates at every possible opportunity. Um, in our union over the last uh, 14 months or so, we've had about 600 new delegates step up. That's great. And providing those delegates with facilities and with rights and, and um you know, respect in the workplace is that has absolutely been a, a priority for our union Um particularly with the change of government where there was there has been a change in approach to some of these matters. So there you go. Any uh, public sector workers listening to this podcast and you want to take on a role, then you should sign up, become a delegate uh, in your local workplace. Can we go back a bit? And uh, obviously we had the uh, ALP National Conference uh, the other week in Brisbane. And I want to talk about the relationship that the union had when Labor was previously in government and get your reflections on that and then get a sense about what does the new relationship need to look like. I, I distinctly remember that the CPSU had its, well, I, I'm just going to use the term strained relationship, but I'll let you uh, describe it, how you best see fit uh, with both the Rudd and the Gillard uh, governments. Um, what did that look like? What, what were the challenges that you found with someone who you would think would be an ally in the, in the and a common, you know, shared values and common goal about what you're trying to achieve in workplaces? Look, I think um, during that period, there were probably a range of areas where the relationship and what the union wanted to see um, from the then Labor government, you know, what we saw didn't meet what we what our members wanted. Um, so particularly around issues of um, uh, public sector jobs and funding for public services, um, we unfortunately saw the federal Labor government at that time a number of times go to efficiency dividend measures, which is a blunt blunt, uh, uh, a blunt cut across all agencies um, to raise, raise funds and to um, deal with other shortfalls in the budget. And, like, from our perspective, um, th- that means thousands of jobs. Um, there was a point um, uh, during uh, one of the election campaigns where that was one of the announcements and the CPSU as a result, pulled out of supporting the government until uh, the government in that election until it was resolved. So there were a number of areas where there was that kind of tension point. Um, in in terms of where we are now at, I, I think we have um, a clearer uh, and stronger relationship and understanding of where the government um, is coming um, uh, 
to in coming to government, but also um, since they've been in government about um, the public sector and the importance of the public sector. And those kind of um, wholesale cuts, um, you know, isn't the government cannot achieve what it would like to do um, across a whole range of policy areas if it's just going to cut and burn the public service. So, um, you know, we've been clear. Um, we will stand up for our members on those issues that that um, are important to our members, regardless of who the government is. It has been pleasing to see um, that the new Albanese government of the two budgets that have been um, that have been held uh, since the change of government that there's been investment in jobs. There's been an increase in jobs in both bu- budgets um, rather than what we saw when uh, Rudd took office um, in 2007. I distinctly remember the 2013 campaign. Uh, I was the, the assistant secretary of the Labor Party in Victoria, and Ast- Aston was one of the target. Was a target seat. Wasn't a target seat. Was a target seat. Wasn't a target seat. And what was playing out was this shit fight going on between the union and and the then the then government. And it was a massive lesson for me, even though I was on the political wing, but obviously a former trade union uh, um, organizer. I just feel like the relationship between the union the industrial wing and the political wing, that that needs to be taken care of first and foremost. And I think about this in terms of other social democratic parties around the world. I would never, ever want to go into an election campaign if I, without ha- making sure that my own people are happy. And I think one of the testaments to the Andrews Labor government here in Victoria, not suggesting that it's all, you know, skittles and rainbows between the union movement and and the, and the Labor government, but I always got a sense that before they went into an election campaign, there was always a strong relationship between the industrial wing and the political wing. Um, how do you, from your perspective, how do you achieve that going into an election campaign? How do you make sure that even ye- months or years before you go back to the polls, that the relationship between the industrial wing and the political wing is strong enough that you don't have this situation where in like 2013 that you guys were, you know, pulling out a supporting a Labor campaign, because that's just a disaster, right? Yeah, look, I think that um, what is what it's about is an alignment of um, values and, and, you know, objectives from both uh, the industrial wing and the political wing of the broader movement. I think that um, you're absolutely right about the time that takes. Um, I suspect if you're trying to do that in, um, in an election campaign, you've already got a major problem. Um, so... It does take um, uh, more time and investment in in um, in the relationships and ensuring that's the case, but it also is about um, you know labor governments. Um, you know we all want to see good labor governments that in, instigate progressive uh, policies, and it is important that um, labor governments are accountable. Um, to union members who want to support them. Um, union members should be in a position that they can support um, a, a Labor government, uh, but they don't want to be, you, you, members don't want to be taken advantage of either. That, that support shouldn't just always be assumed. It, it should be measured on the policies and the strength of the policies that people are prepared to put their name to and back when in government. Let's take a quick break to talk about SwiftFox. Every moment on a campaign matters. You need the tools that you can trust. Lists that are up to date, absolutely. Phone banks uh, that can change minds. Emails that drive donations and events that will energize the community online and offline. And text blasts that distill your message perfectly. SwiftFox CRM is made for campaigners by campaigners. And to find out more, go to swiftfoxcrm.com to win your next campaign. Okay, let's get back to the show. So one of the ways in which we can shape that policy is our triennial national conference of which you were a delegate at uh, and spending a lot of time on the conference floor, clearly moving motions and creating change and not on my podcast. Um, What did you get out of the conference and what did your members get out of the conference? Look, one of the important um, in, uh, policy areas for, the, for CPSU members through that um, conference, and I apologise again for missing your podcast, <laughs> yeah, <you're okay. laughs> um, was about um, reform uh, in, in the employment services area. So we have uh, initiated a campaign about bring back the CES. Uh, we even have retro T-shirts um, to match uh, the CES uh, uh, logo. Uh, but what it's really about is employment services um 
have been wholly privatised. Uh, there's no real oversight. It costs billions of dollars a year to the taxpayer. Um, it is of limited uh, utility to unemployed Australians who are looking for a job. Uh, it is a, of even less use to long-term unemployed uh, because they are higher, um, higher intense cases to manage and employment services providers are just looking for um, to make a dollar out of the whole system. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it is absolutely failing. It's failing employers as well. And we think that there is absolutely a role for the public sector in the, in the provision of these services. And we think, um, you know, it is something that a Labor government should be looking to uh, reform and to bring back a public sector role. And has this, how is this going to fly with the government? Like, I mean, where are you in terms of, um, well, first of all, did you, did you get uh, this endorsed at the conference? Where, what's the next steps to implement this? It sounds a fascinating uh, idea. Yeah, so the position, uh, there was support for the position around bringing back a role for the public sector in employment services. Um, We are continuing discussions with the government um, and relevant ministers about um, how we go about that. There is a parliamentary inquiry underway currently, which will look at, which is looking at the whole system and looking at how you reform it. Um, I think there's widespread um, understanding. I don't think many people dispute that the system's broken. Um, It's how we now work through uh, pulling that apart and um, reforming uh, reforming each element of it so it actually works for all the people who are affected by the system. I'm interested to get a sense uh, what life is like for your members in this sort of post-COVID workplace era. Obviously, we all, certainly people working in the white-collar industry spend a lot of time working at home and flexibility in the workplace and people's work habits drastically changed um, and I wonder what th- that looks like now uh, like is there an expectation from employers to no 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 let's all just go back to how it was pre-2020 uh, or is their uh, appetite f- for uh, th- this ongoing flexibility for, for people in uh, in being able to work from both home and come into the office as well look I think um, impl- from employers, um, including in the public sector, you see a mixed bag of approaches, um, and that's been that has been uh, an issue um, for us to manage, and one that we um, have been seeking through our current bargaining to, to address. For employees, um, you know, the world has changed. Uh, people who think you can say, "Oh, well, you're not working from home anymore," employers who think you can do that, like you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Mm. For so many people. This has changed what they can do. It's changed in lots of circumstances, you know, the hours you can work. It's allowed people um, to manage their lives in such a um, fundamentally better way that allows them to support family and um, other aspects of their personal life and so on. So I think it's really short-sighted for employers to say, oh, well, that's it, everyone back to the office and we'll go back um, to what happened before. Our members have been really clear that they want... um, They want clear rights um, in respect of working from home because currently what we have is a range, you know, a grab bag of policies and different approaches across the public service. And it is of huge frustration um, to workers when uh, two people are doing the same job, um, one's allowed to work from home, one's not, no one knows what the difference is except for, you know, a manager supports it or not. So one of the things we have been seeking, we're engaged in enterprise bargaining with the federal government, Um, and we've now secured, is working from home rights for all employees. Um, That's the right to request. Your request can only be refused in quite limited operational circumstances and there's a bias towards yes. So it's about providing clarity um, and providing a level playing field um, for this. But it's also like from employers' perspective in a tight labour market, I have rarely seen in my union career an issue that moves the dial as much. Uh, People will leave a job today um, if they're not allowed working from home, if that's something that's really important to them. And it is important um, to so many people. So it makes sense for employers in the public sector. It means they actually can, um, you know, engage and potentially attract a different element of the labour market rather than concentrated in Canberra or other capital cities. Um, And it makes sense for employees. So many employees, it's absolutely their number one issue that they want to see clear rights on. That's incredible. But, I mean, I, I don't know if if the data has sort of been uh, compiled, maybe it's too, too soon, but I, certainly anecdotally I've heard that 
productivity went, you know, increased when people started working from home. Because I, I guess the assumption would have been prior to COVID, oh, if people are at home, they're going to be just playing, you know, Nintendo and <laughs> doing cooking or whatever, going for a run and not doing any work. But that wasn't the case. People were incredibly productive, arguably overproductive. In fact, they're probably working too long because they they couldn't create this difference between yeah. home and work, right? Because it, it's all happening in the house. Absolutely. And we, I guess, anticipated that was going to be um, the argument um, for the Converse side about working from home into the future. So uh, we worked with um, academics from UNSW about understanding what the productivity impact was. And definitely um, uh, it has been positive. So there's been productivity in, in, impact, uh, positive productivity impact um, identified over a number of years now. And that's just not employees self-assessing. That's supervisors saying, actually, the staff I manage are more productive when they're working from home. Um, so, so I think there's huge benefits all around. And, and lots of the arguments that um, I see against this um, really reflect, I guess, you know, a lack of maturity in how some managers manage staff. Um, the idea you have to have two eyeballs on, every, on on your staff members to know if they're doing their job is really like really shallow. And if that's how you're managing staff, then you probably have other problems too. And all the technology that's available now, like, I mean, it's not just email anymore, like it's Slack. There's so much stuff that's just so instantaneous that, that if you're a manager, whether they're actually physically in the same building as you or if they're, you know, four hours away living in a remote part of, New South Wales, they're still, you're still in touch with your staff. It's not like you don't know what they're doing, right? And I mean, I mean, look at you and I right now, we're on a thing called Zencaster. This didn't exist before COVID, right? Yeah. The, in, the technological advancement has obviously made it that the workplace, the, 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 how a workplace operates now is fundamentally different to what it was, say, 10 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I should acknowledge that we, of course, have some members who, who you know, work at airports in um, agricultural quarantine and things like that, where you clearly can't do those jobs from home. So it's not everywhere. Um, but so many jobs um, can be done with this flexibility now. And overwhelmingly, I think employees, um, you know, feel respected and trusted and engaged more when they're trusted in these circumstances. And the research shows that the, you know, the case for it around productivity is absolutely there. Speaking about tech, I'm interested to get your thoughts and the union's thoughts on things like AI and what that will mean for jobs and how, as a union, do you get that balance of not wanting to be a, um, you know, a troglodyte and not accept the fact that things do advance, but at the same time, you've got a responsibility to your members to protect their jobs as well. How, what, what do you foresee that looking like into the future? Look, I think um, if many of my members were sitting here talking to you today, the first thing they'd say about public sector IT as a starting point is it, it doesn't work. And so if they could actually just have public sector IT that would uh, work at a basic level, that would be a massive step up. Um, so I think the first thing is around how um, all of this needs actually long-term investment and capacity building um, and so on. And too often, uh, particularly in the public service, um, these um, IT and um, all these information systems are underfunded and under undervalued and then, then under-deliver, which has productivity implications. That's interesting. Um, in terms of AI and technic, you know, technical, uh, uh, technological rather advancements, um, automation, etc. I think these are, you know, ongoing, um, ongoing issues that we need to deal with. I think it's absolutely right um, that um, there are changes that will come in terms of how how work is done and how work is undertaken. Um, I don't think that employees are all against that. I think employees, you know, if I think about a Centrelink uh, workplace and Centrelink workers, they want to help people as quickly and as effectively as they can. Currently, they have to probably work off three databases to try to do that. And when they answer the phone, the person may have been waiting for 20 minutes or more after, you know, trying three times that week to try and get a hold of someone. So our members absolutely want to deliver the best possible services uh, and the best possible um, outcome for the community, um, but it's about going on a. Uh, it's about governments and agencies and employers working with unions about how you actually deliver that. Because there's so often you see, um, you know, examples where uh, an employer or an agency think that they've got some great new initiative, 
They don't engage with the workforce. They implement it. It creates a whole range of unintended consequences, et cetera. So the capacity for this to happen in other spaces where there is much greater scale is really high. So it's about the journey that we need to go on. And workers should be at the middle of that and the centre of that because they want to do the best possible job they can in the most effective way. And there will be ways where AI might be relevant to that. There'll be ways where AI um, is is problematic uh, as well. Uh, But you, you don't get that visibility unless you actually are having the conversation properly with workers. I got it wrong before I said troglodytes, Luddites. I don't know what the troglodytes did, but the Luddites <laughs> were the ones who were against uh, technology advancements. It, you've actually just brought up an, another interesting point there as well. I feel like all through the 90s and t- uh, 2000s, there was this shift by government, primarily by conservative governments, but I'm sure that, that, that our own team had some hand in this as well, that we're trying to move away from, we need to sort of de-invest in government services, subcontract that kind of work out or contract that work out. But one of the, surely one of the lessons from COVID was how reliant our community can be on government services. Are you seeing a shift in the attitude from a public policy sense of back towards we need to reinvest in and in government services in the right areas? Um, so I think that COVID and, and um, you know, particularly in March in 2020 when things just got shut down overnight and you might recall um, Centrelink offices around the country had kilometres of That's exactly waiting. what was in my mind when I was asking that question. Yeah. yeah. And it really did change the dial in terms of people understanding just how important that was. And I remember um, at that time that, you know, it happened over a couple of days, but there was one day where it was really pronounced and, you know, all the news was about these huge lines and speaking to a delegate of ours who'd been a long-term Centrelink worker and was quite late at night and she was just in tears because she was saying, I knew that there were people there who don't have money and aren't going to be able to feed their kids tonight but we can't get to them. We can't, we can't you know, process um, all of this as quickly as we need to. And Services Australia workers and supported other APS workers went into Services Australia to help with that. It was an incredible job um, to get through the work they did. And I think from a community perspective, that did change how people saw the importance of government services. At times, perhaps it's easy to demonise people who need government services, but COVID really showed Everyone in the community can be in that position and need that support um, depending on the circumstances. So I think it has changed the dial. um, But what we need, particularly in a place like uh, Services Australia, is ongoing investment in jobs. So, you know, when you do call, whether it's about your childcare, uh, whether it's about, you know, new start, whatever it's about, that you can get the support you need as quickly as possible. Uh, Last question, it sort of goes to... um the role of unions in workplaces and I asked this question or a similar question of the ACTU president Michelle O'Neill I said to her like you know the stats obviously bear out that the membership union membership in unit density has been falling since uh you know the early 1990s what's the union movement broadly doing to try and win the hearts and minds of particularly young people uh I want to get your thoughts on how does uh unions or how do you how does your union uh, continue to grow, be more relevant in workplaces. I'm assuming the majority of APS workers would be women. Would that be right? Like, um, I've had I've had a colleague of yours, uh, uh, Julia Fox from the SDA, on this show before. She's talked about how sometimes a lot of the solutions that are presented in 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 industrial policy are very geared towards supporting uh, blue collar workers or men, and overlooking the challenges that women face in the workforce and I want to get thoughts on from you about where does how does the union be relevant more to young people to women to you know a bit more diversity now in in the workplace yes absolutely the average public sector worker and the average CPSU member is a probably 42 year old woman who probably um, may well also have be a working mum and um, you know may also work part-time um, and so on so I think Sometimes if you uh, judge the average union member by the front page of The Australian, you'd get a different um, understanding, that you'd get a misperception of some of this. And for, for my union, um, what has been important in terms of ensuring that we reflect the diversity and the concerns and the priorities of our membership, um, of course, 
things like our delegate structure is important, our leadership structure, and ensuring that um, we can reflect our own members in the people who represent them at workplaces and at national levels is incredibly important. I uh, myself am a working mum and when I took on this job um, as National Secretary, I think my um, son had just turned two. And that has limitations, um, to be honest, as a National Secretary in terms of managing all of the responsibilities that you might have. Uh, But it also brings you a perspective about actually, well, this is what lots of our members are dealing with every day. You have to get out of the last meeting on time so you can get to daycare before um, it shuts, et cetera. So I think it's important how we reflect that, but also in terms of our leadership, but it's also important in terms of the issues that we um, that we prosecute. And at my union has, you know, been a long-term advocate for increases in parental leave, for example. And of course, parental leave should not just be maternity leave, it should be for um, non-birth parents as well. But moving the dial for um, people and workers in all of these ways um, is critically important in ensuring that we uh, relate to and we reflect um, the priorities of our members and other workers in the workplace and, and make ourselves um, a way you achieve those things in the workplace is by being part of the union. What's the final message of hope that you want to leave uh, your members that may be listening to this podcast? What's the future for the CPSU looking like in the next sort of five, that's five or ten years? I've just done the question that I don't know the answer to when I said before, like if you ask me what I'm doing in five or ten years, I would have a clue now I'm putting it on you. But I just want to sort of end on a high note, uh, uh, Mel, where, where are we going from here? Look, we have a big job of work to do in the federal public sector and for uh, for our members about rebuilding the public service, about uh, reinvesting in jobs, um, about resetting the dial on contracting out and outsourcing and, of course, consultants, which have just eroded such capacity. So there's a big job of work to do there. We have made a good start on that. Um, but there is more to do. And similarly, a big job of work around rebuilding, uh, you know, what's happened to our wages and conditions of job security. They've been under such attack. Again, we have made a good start on these things. Um, But what I would say to any uh, CPSU member listening is the way we do that is together. The The way we achieve the public service and services that we want to deliver for the community, as well as the jobs that we want uh, for our colleagues and for those who come after us is by acting together um, to deliver those outcomes. So if you are working in the Australian public sector, join the CPSU today. For God's sake, what have you, get into your union and become a delegate as well and take on leadership roles in your local workplace. Cousin, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been great to have you and we wish you the best of luck in the future. Excellent. Thank you. Hey there. Thanks for listening to Social Democratic. Did you like the podcast? Hit the follow or subscribe button and be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. And to get all the latest updates on Socially Democratic, follow Dunn Street on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn. And we'll see you next Friday. Socially Democratic was brought to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. Morris Blackburn Lawyers have spent more than a century paving the hard path to justice for everyday Australians. They've helped over 500,000 Australians turn their situation around and they know how the system works. Their experience and skills means you'll get the best results possible. Find out more on their website, morrisblackburn.com.au. Morris Blackburn, experience you can count on. Socially Democratic was brought to you by SwiftFox. Every moment on a campaign matters. You need the tools that you can trust, lists that are up to date, phone banks that can change minds, emails that drive donations, events that will energise the community online and offline and text blasts that distill your message perfectly. SwiftFox CRM is made for campaigners by campaigners. To find out more, go to swiftfoxcrm.com to win your next campaign.